Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today, to be honest with you, I'm just a little bit upset. Not because of everything happening in the world today, but instead because we are repeating the mistakes of the past. On your screen right now, you can see a Chicago Sun-Times article entitled, Ban Sale of Grand Theft Auto, Other Violent Video Games, State rep says, with carjackings rising, Representative Marcus Evans wants to prohibit the sale of violent video games promoting criminal activity. And if we go and we look at this story, you can see it's exactly what it says on the tin. With carjackings on the rise, a Southside Democratic state representative has introduced a bill that would ban the sale of Grand Theft Auto and other violent video games as defined in the statute, which of course, here in virtual legality, we will take a look at. Representative Marcus Evans Jr. wants to amend a 2012 law preventing some video games from being sold to minors. The bill would prohibit the sale of some of these games that promote the activities that we are suffering from in our communities. I feel like this game has become a huge issue in this spectrum. Walker said, when you compare the two, you see harsh similarities as it relates to these carjackings. Yes, Games like Grand Theft Auto that simulate a carjacking do, in fact, depict a carjacking. But, as I said at the top of this video, this kind of thing makes me angry. Not just because it's silly on its face, and we'll talk about that in and of itself, but how much it goes against jurisprudence on the First Amendment and the Constitution, both of the state of Illinois and the United States, and how we keep getting stuck in this discussion because politicians of all stripes look to video games and violent video games in particular for whatever ails them. There's been a long history of this. We've got articles about Trump pointing figures at gruesome and grisly video games after mass shootings. We've got Joe Biden referring to video game developers as a little creep sitting around a table who told me he was an artist because he was able to come up with games to teach you how to kill people. And lest you think that it's just Trump and Biden in our modern era, oh no, If you don't know, Night Trap and the hearings in the Senate from my youth really started this entire ball rolling. For as long as there have been video games, there have been politicians that have sought to blame them for whatever was happening in their jurisdiction, to pass laws, to interrogate video game makers about them, with nary a bit of evidence to suggest that playing Grand Theft Auto or any other game encourages you to murder or carjack or anything else. But that doesn't matter to this Illinois representative. And we can actually take a look at the law that he proposed to see what it is that he says he's going to do. So this is an act from 2012 in the current Illinois code that prohibits the sale of violent video games to minors. Remember that. We're going to come back to that because I am not at all certain that this law on the books as it stands today is in fact constitutional, but this is going to shine a bit of a spotlight on it. So In the amendment proposed by this representative, he would get rid of the definition for minor. We don't need it anymore because we're prohibiting everything. And we would change the definition of violent video game from one that was really related to human on human violence or physical harm to another human to the following definition. A video game that allows a user or player, and clear what the difference would be there, to control a character within the video game that is encouraged to perpetuate human on human violence in which the character kills or otherwise causes serious physical or psychological harm to another human or an animal. Just throwing an animal here as as opposed to human on human violence from the existing definition. And then because that might not get you to carjackings, he added this psychological component and added it in the definition. Serious physical harm, sure. Also psychological harm, which includes depictions of death, dismemberment, amputation, decapitation, maiming, disfigurement, mutilation of body parts. I think we're all pretty clear that those are violent actions child abuse, sexual abuse, animal abuse, domestic violence, violence against women, rape, or, and this one just comes out of nowhere because we know that this was why the law was being proposed, motor vehicle theft with the driver or passenger present inside the vehicle when the theft begins. That's not inherently violent. Uh, It's a violent action certainly to steal from somebody and there's somebody in the car and to throw them out of the car and to do these various kinds of things. But just the fact that you stole a motor vehicle with a passenger present isn't specifically the same kind of violence as decapitation or dismemberment. And so the concept of it being psychological, that the person in the passenger seat is terrorized, which is undoubtedly the case in real life, 
has been added to this definition. The problem really comes as this continues. Instead of restricting the sale of violent or uh, violent video games to minors, these sales would be prohibited. Prohibited. Sale or rental of violent video games. A person who sells, rents, or permits to be sold or rented any violent video game commits a petty offense for which a fine of $1,000 may be imposed. Under this law, they would ban the sale of anything that could possibly fall under these definitions in the state of Illinois in its entirety. Now, before we talk about the many, many ways in which this is a problem, the first thing we have to point out is that this definition isn't a very good one, right? This was intended to expand from human-on-human violence to the concept of a user or player controlling a character, but then still requires a human-on-human component or physical or psychological harm to an animal, which means I can't tell you sitting at what is proposed here in this draft bill whether or not Pac-Man counts, whether or not the ghosts are animals, whether or not various cartoon configurations of this counts. After all, video games are always at least a step or two separate from real life. Certainly the Grand Theft Auto characters are designed to depict humans, but if you go down the spectrum to cartoon people, is Cloud Strife in Final Fantasy VII with his big block hands, is that depicting a human? Is violence between the humans in that story, Final Fantasy VII? Is that a violent video game? for purposes of this kind of connection. I know if you've played Final Fantasy VII, you know there's some human-on-human violence in there, and that's not necessarily encouraged, but certainly the fighting in the battle system is. So where does this end? Now, that's going to have its own problems because ambiguity is an issue for any statute and whether it's constitutional. One of the things we demand of our laws in the United States and in other jurisdictions is that you know when you break them. And so if ambiguity is introduced, the courts oftentimes have an issue with them. But in this particular case, it's worse than that. Before we get to that, I do want to point out that this representative, as a state official in the state of Illinois, had to take an oath of office that said, I solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Illinois, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office to the best of my ability. Now, I don't want to disparage this particular representative. Maybe his abilities are very low and he isn't, in fact, breaching this oath. But if they aren't so low, breaching it is all that he is doing. Let's talk about the First Amendment a little bit. I pulled up one of my favorite resources. It's the Cornell Legal Information Institute. Honestly, you could give an entire semester class, and I'm sure many law schools are doing it, on the very, very many ways in which the courts have interpreted the First Amendment. But I just want to start out with the overall concept here. As a general matter, government may not regulate speech because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. That is the very heart of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, speaking or creating things with speech incorporated within it. Now, if you think, okay, that's Congress, that's the federal government, you should know that the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was quote-unquote incorporated against the states through the actions of the 14th Amendment, where the Constitution now says no state shall deprive a person without due process of law or deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Whole lot of constitutional law classes you could take on this. Suffice it to say, for purposes of this video, the 14th Amendment acts to make the First Amendment something that the state of Illinois has to listen to when, for instance, you're making oaths about supporting the Constitution of the United States and the state of Illinois. Now, the next part of this I want to talk about is if you do make a law in the United States that does abridge freedom of speech, you might think that the First Amendment would say, hey, Congress shall make no law. There isn't a lot of wiggle room there. Well, The Supreme Court and the judicial branch has found a fair amount of wiggle room, as, of course, has the legislature. And so the basic rule is Congress shall make no law really means Congress shall make no law unless, or as Cornell says here, the constitutionality of content-based regulation is determined by a compelling interest test derived from equal protection analysis. The government must show that its regulation is necessary to serve a compelling state interest and is narrowly drawn to achieve that end, what we might otherwise call strict scrutiny. Now, one of the 
features of a strict scrutiny review at the at the court level is that almost all laws that have to face a strict scrutiny standard get overturned by the court. It's a very, very high standard for the state and other governments to meet. So if you hit strict scrutiny, which means you are regulating content in speech, then you're going to have trouble getting your law upheld. Now, you might also say, Rick, okay, that's First Amendment protection for speech and for press, but we're not talking about somebody making a statement about a border wall or about the tax code or about things of importance. We're talking about Rockstar making a Grand Theft Auto game. Does that really apply to things that are solely like video games? Which I would answer, well, you know, we have some jurisprudence to look at on this kind of thing. Let's look at something. Oh, is it recent? No, this is from 1947. In this particular case, Appellant is a New York City book dealer convicted on information of a misdemeanor for having in his possession with intent to sell certain magazines charged to violate the subsection of the New York penal law. What did that law say? It said a person who prints, utters, publishes, sells, lends, gives away, distributes, or shows, or has in his possession with intent to sell, lend, give away, distribute, or show any book devoted to the publication and principally made up of criminal news, police reports, or accounts of criminal deeds or pictures or stories of deeds of bloodshed, lust, or crime is guilty of a misdemeanor. And here back in the 40s, you had some more strong obscenity jurisprudence. The New York defense here tried to get it under those obscenity rules, and yet the court said no. We recognize the importance of the exercise of a state's police power to minimize all incentives to crime, particularly in the field of sanguinary or salacious publications with their stimulation of juvenile delinquency. I love reading old cases. We do not accede to Apelli's suggestion that the constitutional protection for a free press applies only to the exposition of ideas. The line between the informing and the entertaining is too elusive for the protection of that basic right. Though we can see nothing of any possible value to society in these magazines, They are as much entitled to the protection of free speech as the best of literature. They are equally subject to control if they are lewd, indecent, obscene, or profane. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Now, of course, the 1940s is not when the court stopped looking at First Amendment questions. We have other indications of similar kind of concepts. You might say, okay, it's fine to make an idea. It's fine to give a speech or to write a pamphlet or a book or make a video game. But could you prohibit the receiving of it? Could you prohibit the selling of it? The court once again talks about this. It is now well established that the Constitution protects the right to receive information and ideas. This freedom of speech and press necessarily protects the right to receive. This right to receive information and ideas, regardless of their social worth. We in the court are not going to judge whether we think this has any value at all. If it presents a freedom of speech question, the government won't step in. It is fundamental to our free society. The right to receive information and ideas, regardless of their worth, is fundamental to our free society. So you now have a couple of cases. This is the 40s and the 60s and and various old cases that would give any reasonable Illinois representative enough warning of what the First Amendment requires of him. You might still say, okay, Rick, you've talked about books and pamphlets and really old laws. We're talking about video games. Aren't they different? And I would say, well, if only there were a Supreme Court case that looked at a state statute and whether or not a state could impose restrictions on the sale of violent video games. Wouldn't that be nice? At which point I might click over to the next website and show you Brown versus the Entertainment Merchants Association, a Supreme Court decision in 2011 delivered by Justice Scalia. California Assembly Bill 1179 prohibits the sale or rental of violent video games to minors and requires their packaging to be labeled 18. The act covers games in which the range of options available to a player includes killing, maiming, dismembering, or sexually assaulting an image of a human being. If those acts are depicted in a manner that a reasonable person, considering the game as a whole, would find appeals to a deviant or morbid interest of minors that is patently offensive, to prevailing standards in the community as to what is suitable for minors. In fact, this is trying to drive this into an obscenity kind of question. The Supreme Court will reject it as part of this case, but you don't even see this kind of hand waved in the Illinois proposal. It's just no, not even is it limited to minors. It's just everybody can't do it. Can't sell anything of a violent nature, a direct 
direct regulation on the content of the video game itself, not applicable to other forms of media, and it's going to run into so many problems. Continuing with this case, respondents representing the video game and software industries brought a pre-enforcement challenge to the act in the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. That court concluded that the act violated the First Amendment and permanently enjoined its enforcement. California correctly acknowledges that video games qualify for First Amendment protection. That's actually the end of this story. We're going to read more about it. We're going to talk more about it. But once you concede that video games are, in fact, potentially artistic, whether or not they have social worth doesn't matter to the court. Remember that they are protected by the First Amendment if you try to regulate their content, if you try to prohibit the creation of something by prohibiting its sale. Prior restraint, we call it in the law, you're going to have a major, major problem. And this particular case at the Supreme Court level is going to be a major hurdle for you. The most basic of these principles is as a general matter, government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. Last term, as of 2011, Justice Scalia is no longer with us, in Stevens, we heard that new categories of unprotected speech may not be added to the list by a legislature that concludes certain speech is too harmful to be tolerated. They held that. They didn't hear it. This particular case was about animal cruelty. The court rejected Congress's attempt to add specific protections for animal cruelty, or more specifically, to restrict them and to add protections for folks that don't want to see that, as I think probably the bulk of my audience does, hopefully. That holding controls this case. As in Stevens, California has tried to make violent speech regulation look like obscenity regulation. Why? Because obscenity is one of those categories that gets outside the First Amendment. Supreme Court hasn't done a great job of establishing what obscenity is. This is where you get the I know it when I see it kind of description of obscenity and it morphs and changes around what is a community standard. Here the court says it doesn't matter. Regulating violent video games isn't the same as regulating obscenity. Why? Our cases have been clear that the obscenity exception to the First Amendment does not cover whatever a legislature finds shocking, but only depictions of sexual conduct and specific ones at that. So if you're dealing with violence and violent video games, this might be a surprise to those of you that are outside the United States. You can't cover it under the obscenity exception to First Amendment protections. You'd have to find another way. Or as the court continues, because speech about violence is not obscene, it is of no consequence that California's statute mimics the New York statute regulating obscenity for minors that we upheld in our prior case in the 1960s. California does not argue that it is empowered to prohibit selling offensively violent works to adults, ding, 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 and it is wise not to, since that is but a hair's breadth from the argument rejected in Stevens. So this case actually calls out, well, it's a good thing the state of California was only aiming this at preventing the sale to minors because if they weren't, even though we're still going to reject the, the act that they proposed, if they weren't, it would look even worse for them. And then you go back and you look at the Illinois law and you say, oh my goodness, this is prohibiting the very a sale to anyone, the existence, a prior restraint on making any game that might have a character that is encouraged to perpetuate human on human violence, regardless of whether or not it has social worth. You might be able to create something of an artistic genius that establishes why human on human violence is always wrong by effectively encouraging it through your interactive video game. But the state of Illinois wouldn't let you make it because they won't let you sell it. And so that's a prior restraint on your ability to speak. And the court has already opined on this very issue. California's argument would fare better if there were a longstanding tradition in this country of, speci of specially restricting children's access to depictions of violence, but there is none. Certainly the books we give children to read or read to them when they are younger contain no shortage of gore. Grimm's fairy tales, for example, are grim indeed, as her just desserts for trying to poison Snow White, the Wicked Queen, is made to dance in red-hot slippers till she fell dead on the floor, a sad example of envy and jealousy. High school reading lists are full of similar fare. Homer's Odysseus blinds Polyphemus, the Cyclops, by grinding out his eye with a heated steak. And I apologize uh, retroactively for any pronunciations with the good old Odyssey. I'm not very good at those pronunciations. Never has been. California claims that video games present special problems because they are interactive. I imagine a lot of you would have thought the same thing. Okay, well, those are books still. Video games might be subject to the First Amendment, but video games are obviously different. What does the court think about that? 
Well, the court dismisses it out of hand. The latter feature is nothing new. Since at least the publication of The Adventures of You, Sugarcane Island in 1969, young readers of Choose Your Own Adventure Stories have been able to make decisions that determine the plot by following instructions about which page to turn to. That's right. Choose Your Own Adventures are the very same as video games, according to the late Justice Scalia. You don't have to agree with that proposition, by the way. I obviously don't, but it does kind of go to build the foundations of what the court is looking at here. Making a prior restraint on First Amendment speech is enormously difficult, and every court is going to look askance at it. You have to prove a compelling interest if you're the government, which for this purpose means you have to prove that Grand Theft Auto and the like lead to carjackings, and that's going to be a big problem for you. As Judge Posner has observed, all literature is interactive. The better it is, the more interactive. Literature, when it is successful, draws the reader into the story, makes him identify with the characters, invites him to judge them and quarrel with them, to experience their joys and sufferings as the reader's own. And of course, this would apply, to the extent that it does apply, to movies and television or web series or whatever else it might be. You might also think that things could just get too bad. Maybe there's a level of violence that is a problem. Justice Alito certainly thought that. In this particular case, as they dismiss Justice Alito's complaints, they say, Justice Alito recounts disgusting video games in order to disgust us, but disgust is not a valid basis for restricting expression. And the same is true of Justice Alito's description of those video games he has discovered that have a racial or ethnic motive for their violence. To what end does he relate this? Does it somehow increase the aggressiveness that California wishes to suppress? Who knows? But it does arouse the reader's ire and the reader's desire to put an end to this horrible message. Thus, ironically, Justice Alito's argument highlights the precise danger posed by the California Act and other acts like it, of course, that the ideas expressed by speech, whether it be violence or gore or racism or anything else, and not its objective effects, may be the real reason for governmental proscription. We don't go down this slippery slope of allowing content to be regulated because it's far too easy for the government, whether it's the state of California, the state of Illinois, or the federal government to come in and say, hey, those ideas, those are a problem for us. And if those ideas are a problem for us, well, you shouldn't be allowed to see them. You shouldn't be making them. You shouldn't be allowed to sell them. The court, I think in my opinion, certainly rightly says that should be a problem for everyone. Because the act imposes a restriction on the content of protected speech, it is invalid unless California can demonstrate that it passes strict scrutiny. That is, as we talked about, unless it is justified by a compelling government interest and is narrowly drawn to serve that interest. California cannot, and nor can Illinois, let's be honest, meet that standard. At the outset, it acknowledges that it cannot show a direct causal link between violent video games and harm to minors. Even if it could... That wouldn't necessarily be a compelling state interest because you'd still have to attach it to problems that only the government can solve and that the prohibition is the most narrowly tailored way to solve those problems. So here you have a representative in Illinois that says carjackings are up. I think we should ban violent video games. Violent video games, by the way, that have contained depictions of carjackings well before the recent rise in carjackings in Chicago or in Illinois. So you've already got a kind of confounding factor with the science behind all this. You've got a Supreme Court case directly on point that says a California act that tried to do less, that in fact tries to do what your current law says, was invalid as unconstitutional. You try to broaden it and you don't even defend the reasoning behind it. Even taking for granted Dr. Anderson's conclusions that violent video games produce some effect on children's feelings of aggression, those effects are both small and, here's an important piece, indistinguishable from effects produced by other media. You're targeting video games based on content restrictions that are a problem for the First Amendment. You're not talking about books or magazines or web series or Netflix shows or anything else. What are you even doing, California, says the Supreme Court, and I believe would say the same thing to the state of Illinois, although we'll talk about that at the end here. And that's how this continues. You have a case directly on point that says, yeah, video games protected by the First Amendment. A restriction on video game sales to minors is a problem because it is restricting content in a way that the court doesn't generally allow. If you go to prohibit it in Illinois, that's going to be a bigger problem. And you're a state rep that's made an oath, right? You made an oath to follow the Constitution that has been determined by the Supreme Court. 
as of today in 2021, and you're not doing that because you think there's a problem and you think you've got a tool and you can just use it. And that continues to be a problem for me, right? We talk about a lot of issues in virtual legality, and I know a lot of people out there in various political stripes, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green Party, whatever it might be, want what's best for the country, want to improve the country in some way. Too many of them, of all political stripes, basically just say, well, we'll get past what we can get past. We'll run whatever we can up the flagpole. And if a court strikes it down, that's fine. That's not how the civil system was supposed to work. You make these O's like they make in Illinois, like they make in Michigan, like they make in every jurisdiction, because the legislature, as well as the executive, as well as the judicial branches of every jurisdiction, they all have a responsibility to try to stay within the bright line guardrails of the constitution of their jurisdiction. So this state rep in Illinois makes me angry because it's clear that he didn't do any of his homework. And if he did, if you had an interview with him, he would very likely say, well, let the court strike it down if it's unconstitutional. And honestly, I think that's the worst possible thing you can do in that seat. You're voted up to do what's right for your constituents. Different people are going to have different opinions on that. But each side has agreed to play within the rules, the rules of the game here, the Constitution. And this has been settled. Now, could the Supreme Court change? Of course, the constituency of the Supreme Court has changed. There are different people. Justice Scalia is no longer there. Could the court come back and say, now, suddenly, this is legal? Of course they could. But very, very unlikely in a situation like this. A blanket prohibition with no backing, proposed and wasting taxpayer dollars in the state of Illinois. Because if the state of Illinois' legislature is wise, they'll look at this in committee and they say, no, we're not voting up on that. We're not defending those lawsuits from the ESA and Activision Electronic Arts and whomever. And we don't want to deal with a multiple long video series in virtual legality. That guy is crazy. And still, here we are talking about it in 2021. If you've got your own opinion on it, please leave it in the comments to this video. Obviously, I'm very passionate about this topic. In fact, the Night Trap and various other violent Senate committee hearings back in the 90s were part of why I got into law and discussed economics. I loved video games at the time. They were using references to things like, I think it was Urban Strike or Desert Strike or one of those old EA games. And I was just floored by how ridiculous these senators were. And that kind of led me on the life that has resulted in virtual legality. So if you got your own opinions, you followed those things back in the 90s, leave a comment to this video. I'd love to hear from you because obviously this is a item of extreme passion for me. Otherwise, this has been virtual legality for today. If you like this, if you like discussing business and law of video games, probably first and foremost, but also pop culture in general, music, movies, television, the things that you're otherwise reading about, consider supporting the channel. We've got a Patreon. We've got Streamlabs tips available. We've got shirts and sweatshirts. And yes, I know a number of the commenters want some different mugs. We're going to work on that. Get those into the Teespring store. And if none of that floats your boat, if you just subscribe, ring the bell, leave a comment to make Google happy, and most importantly, tell your friends that we are out there, well, every little bit helps. And I am so, so thankful for your contribution to the growth of the channel. Otherwise, if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.